All right, joining me now is a first-time guest, Jim Lee. Jim has put out this website right here that we talked about last night. I love the fact that it's so organized and you can find about the history, which I did not know until yesterday watching one of his videos, and I brought you a few minutes of it last night, that there's a hundred years of weather manipulation. Just a while ago, I played a video clip from May of 1962, then Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson talking about he who controls the weather controls the world. So this is something that's been going on a very long time. This guy spent years into documenting, documenting it and putting it uh, up online at weathermodificationhistory.com, weathermodificationhistory.com. He comes to us via my friend Patrick Wood, who heard him speak in person once and said yesterday to me, this is a guy you need to be following. This is a guy you need to be uh, interviewing. He keeps it on facts and documentation. So... We tracked him down, and we're honored to have him here with us, Jim Lee of weathermodificationhistory.com. Jim, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Brennan. Uh, great to have great you. Great show so far. Oh, well, thank you. Glad you're enjoying it. I'm going to have Patrick on uh, pretty quick after you. going to get a report from our weatherman there in uh, Florida and then go to uh, Patrick Wood. I want to go to this, this graphic on your website. Can you explain this to us? You list, uh, I guess, 10 different ways. Uh, is this... 10 ways of weather uh, modification technologies. Is that what this is? And that is correct. Um, so I'm, I've been a graphics artist uh, for better part of 30 years. I'm 48 years old. And um, I just, I, I like to teach people in different ways. And some people are visual learners. Um, so I wanted to make an infographic that captured 10 technologies to own the weather today. And if you break it into into three very distinct categories, weather modification, geoengineering, and space weather modification, things like HARP, sounding rockets. Um, this encapsulates all of them, including what the scientists, the atmospheric you know, people would rather you call accidental geoengineering, like ship tracks, um, wet surface air coolers, nuclear power plants to put a lot of water vapor into the atmosphere, make artificial clouds, and the dreaded C word, whether it's chemtrails, contrails, plane farts, or as I like to call them, cirrus clouds. Um, hashtag cirrus clouds matter. I encapsulated that all into a not only a graphic that shows the technologies, but where the technologies are active. Well, we, this has been 100 years in the making. You've documented that. We're going to get to some of that timeline. But yet people think this is conspiracy, some people. Even so-called conservatives, I know, have been on social media saying, don't believe all these reports. They're conspiracy theories. But yet we were playing, I think it was uh, uh, Nora O'Donnell the other night, a video of her talking about it with a guy uh, who would say, oh, you know, it's allegedly the CIA was manipulating the water, the uh, weather during uh, Vietnam. And uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie was sitting, Charlie Rose was sitting there with her. That was nine years ago. The BBC has run a piece on NASA developing clouds and then, and then making rain. Uh, this is far from conspiracy theory, but yet we even have people in the conservative world posting on social media that folks shouldn't be listening to this. That's a little frustrating because this is overwhelmingly documented scientific experiments going on, correct? Yeah, they're, they're, this is conspiracy reality. Um, and, and that's the slogan on my other website, climateviewer.com, where conspiracy meets reality. So I don't delve in the what ifs and why fors. Um, I deal in facts. And um, I have never met, whether it's a politician, a scientist, or, you know, a regular NPC um, lemming, you know, who's just into football and doesn't care about anything else, that I couldn't convince within five minutes of showing them my material that this is not a conspiracy. The only conspiracy is that you were never told about it. Yeah. And that's what I like to say to people. Just because you don't know about it doesn't make it a conspiracy. I'm going to go to your website, weathermodificationhistory.com. Let's go there. I'm going to scroll to the bottom, and then we'll pick it up right here. So you've got, oh, you're starting back at about 1890 to 1892. Tell me, you know, you can, we can kind of scroll through this and grab a few of your favorite ones along the way. Which one do you want to start with? 
Well, I started at 1850 with James Pollard Espy. And honestly, like I could have gone further back, but I wanted to start in a semi modern era. We're not going to go back to Indians, you know, Native Americans dancing. We're not going to go back to black powder rifles at an Antietam causing rain. Um, we're going to start with people intentionally trying to change the weather or climate. And James Pollard Espy was the, he created the first U.S. Navy map. And he uh, he proposed burning forest, lighting forest fires intentionally on the West Coast to make it rain on the East Coast. So he earned the name the Storm King. Um, another really crazy story is in 1916, there was a, a gentleman named Charles Mallory Hatfield. And he was paid by Los Angeles uh, to make it rain. And that's right there. You'll see the guy in the... Uh, black and white. Yeah, right here. Right there. Yeah, Charles Mad Hatfield. Um, each one of these things on the timeline, if you click on them, there's going to be details about it. There's going to be several references at the bottom, and then a usually an image or video gallery included in that with original newspaper articles. Um, this must have taken you guys years to put together. Um, I'm pretty quick, uh, but wow. yeah. Um, the, the irony of this is you're about to have Patrick Wood on. I met Patrick Wood and in um, 2015, uh, yeah, in 2016, and at Geo Griffin's um, Freedom Force International um, Conference. And I gave a PowerPoint presentation, and during that PowerPoint presentation, I said, when I get back home, by the time I'm done um, flying home, I'll have a weathermodificationhistory.com for you to check out because I knew that the DVD would be coming out later. So interestingly enough, that's how I met Patrick Wood. That's how you met me, isn't it? That's how right. Neat that's how right. everything comes together. Um, but this website I created because I wanted to take my opinions out of everything. I had been working on climateviewer.com since 2012. Um, and I had a website before that, but I, I deleted the whole thing. Um, and this website is a reference website. It has literally been cited in over 200 peer reviewed journals and books. So I built this site to educate people sans my opinions or beliefs or, um, you know, any of my con individual conspiracies. So if you want to look at what you were talking about earlier with operation Popeye, um, which should be up on that sidebar, by the way, um, I have like a, a, a popular um, thing, but yeah, it's, it would be right at um, 1967. 1967. Um, all right. Let's go up there. 1967. And yep, see right there yeah, is a yeah, C-130. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you can zoom in on that a little bit, you can just hold the control button and roll the wheel up or what. Yeah, you got windows and mm -hmm. you can zoom in on that and actually see it. But if you scroll to the bottom, there's a whole lot of newspapers and documents that you're not going to see anywhere else on this. Um, and people don't know that about the history of weather warfare and how the CIA was embedded in the Department of Defense. And this actually led to hearings by Senator Claiborne Pell, who's on the right there, um, because Jack Anderson, or as I like to call him, Jack Anderson, um, reporter of the year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this guy's a living, you know, he was a living legend. Yep. Um, he, he saw a note on Lyndon Johnson's desk. And that's what led to breaking the story in the Pentagon Papers that led to the congressional hearings held by Senator Claiborne Pell, which led to the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972, the Weather Modification Policy Act of 1976, and eventually the Environmental Modification Convention at the United Nations, um, which, air quotes, banned weather warfare. In the meantime, the CIA was also engaged in weather warfare against Cuba. So many people know about Operation Popeye as, you know, U.S. turns um, weather and rain into weapon. I mean, the Look newspaper articles. Rain making over trail tried by CIA. CIA rain making over Laos. I mean, good grief. Weather modification used for warfare, Senator Hintz. I mean, that's back in 1973, right there, that article. Uh, Senator to seek NATO ban of weather wars. Uh, new science, weather warfare. 
Uh, here we go. Sunday News Journal. What, rain making used as weapon in Southeast Asia. I mean, look at all these articles for Pete's sake. It, and, and and what's crazy about it is, you know, I'm just picking select few. There there's over 850 newspapers in our newspaper vault, which is up on the top menu. So if you go to weathermodificationhistory.com, there's an interactive timeline, which is what we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort it by category. You can sort it by tags like weather warfare or hurricane modification. Seems to be a real hot topic right now. Um, and then there's a newspaper vault at the very top, which has over 850 newspapers, which were delicately recreated by my good friend Dominic Marama up in Canada. Um, so you could say this is an international cooperation, cooperative effort between uh, myself, um, James Lee, Jim Lee, and Dominic Marama in Canada. And we joined forces, of course, I made the whole website. He just did some pictures. Um, but no, he was going to Google News and literally taking all of the different sections of the newspaper, clipping them out, turning them into a single image, then getting the header from the front page and putting it all that on there. I don't think anybody will ever appreciate the amount of work and effort that's gone into creating just the newspapers, let alone the entire website and all the research that oh, went into Well, I can tell you, I can tell it's a ton of work. I mean... Uh, we, we, we could talk about this for hours, and I'm definitely going to have to get you back on this. But I want to go to this, uh, this, this one here. Perfect Storm Fury, uh, August 17, 1962 to 1960, or excuse me, 1962 to 1983. W what is that one about? That was NOAA's efforts to uh, modify hurricanes. Now, cloud seeding, the, the stuff we were talking about earlier is known as the age of pluviculture, according to Dr. James Roger Fleming, who I, you know, but longtime fan, actually got to interview him in person, made my day. Um, and he calls it the age of pluviculture because before 1946, they were trying anything and everything to make it rain, from burning just strange chemicals to using hail cannons, electrified sand, x-rays on balloons, anything they could think of. But in 1946, that all changed with the birth of cloud seeding. And less than 11 months later, they did the first hurricane seeding project called Project Cirrus. It is actually the 70th anniversary of the first hurricane seeding project. Um, Noah just put it up on their website. Um, and after Project Cirrus, and that, now that went horribly bad. They actually turned a tropical storm into a hurricane, which then slammed into Savannah, Georgia. Yeah, that's this one right here. It's right there, Project Cir uh, Cirrus. Cirrus, like, yep. And, and, and that's where they dumped dry ice, right, and made that thing turn around? That's correct. The Cape Sable um, hurricane. And it abruptly changed directions, colors, and became a hurricane slamming into Savannah, Georgia. There were lawsuits over it. Um, big fuss. But that didn't stop them from going on to Project Scud and then Project Storm Fury. Um, Storm Fury being the largest one. And just recently. What year was um, that? What year was that? So I can find it. Yeah, there it is. Project uh, Fury, 1960, right there. Yeah, Storm Fury uh, was uh, probably the the biggest one. Um, oh, I think that's Skyfire you're looking at. Yeah, that's Skyfire. Which one? Which, which one? Skyfire is about preventing lightning um, bolts. Um, just uh, go to St um, Storm Fury next because documentation on Project Scud is like almost non-existent. Wow. So I haven't even I haven't I haven't even created a timeline entry for it yet. I have so many more things I'm going to add to the timeline. It, I'm always adding new things. Um, we just came across the inventor of uh, the television, RCA, um, a guy named Vladimir Zawrink, Zawrinkin, something like that. Um, he actually created a weather control rocket in 1948. He got a patent for it. He applied for a patent, and the, the DOD and the um, government kept it a secret and didn't actually issue him his patent until 1962. So this is really open to can of worms because the technology that he was doing was far advanced from anything else that's even in the timeline. There's always new stuff popping up. Um, but with Project Storm Fury, they were attempting to see multiple um, tropical storms and hurricanes over two decades. And during that, the CIA also used a part of Project Storm Fury to steer hurricanes into Cuba. 
to try to take out um castros on um, crops that's the um china lake cold cloud modification system or as we like to call them cloud seeding bombs um not exactly commercial equipment you're looking at right there that's a pretty rare photo and then those are the jado flare racks that were used also in um uh, operation popeye weather warfare over vietnam as they like to call it make mud not war picking on the hippies um so there's a long history to this that most people have no clue. And when you start to dig into the history of it, you quickly learn that history does repeat itself. So in 2008, the Department of Homeland Security had a hurricane modification workshop to prevent the next Katrina from happening. Interestingly enough, now I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on. Um, there was a hurricane drought from from the end of Katrina till Donald Trump got in office. And interestingly enough, the first thing that Donald Trump did when he got in office was cancel the Paris Climate Accord. And coincidentally, in 2008, they were trying to stop hurricanes from coming. Ten years of hurricane droughts, no hurricanes making um, landfall, any major hurricanes at all. And then three hurricanes simultaneously hit the southern states, the rednecks that voted um, Donald Trump into office. I can say that because I'm in South Carolina. Um, I'm one of those rednecks. And that is not a coincidence. And here we go again. It's election season. The South is getting battered. Um, it's really interesting so you times think, we live you, in. You think, uh, Jim, that what you're seeing in North Carolina with Hurricane uh, Helene, and now with Milton, you believe there is evidence? Do you think there's evidence? Do you see any evidence or anything that causes you to be of concern that there's a uh, manipulation going on there? My concern is that there is no transparency or accountability or even way to catch these people doing the things that they're talking about doing. So the idea that they would dump carbon black dust into a hurricane to steer it, to intensify it, or possibly mitigate it, um, would be done from approximately 50,000 feet with um, C-130J Super Hercules planes. Um, this was discussed at the DHS meeting on controlling hurricanes by Mosh Alamaro from MIT University. He was actually referencing William Gray from 1974, who said in a paper called Carbon Dust Absorption of Solar Radiation that by dumping black chemicals into the top of a cold pool in a hurricane that the sun's heat would heat those black chemicals and change the direction or intensity of a hurricane. So it would have been one thing if somebody just said it in 1974, but Mosh Alamaro from MIT University said it in 2008 at the Department of Homeland Security workshop on control and hurricanes. So if there was um, an attempt to do any of these, the problem is that it would be at 50,000 feet above the cirrus wall, above the cloud shield of the hurricane. So you couldn't visibly see it from the ground. Number two, if it's military flights, let alone CIA involved, they're not going to have their ADSB transponders turning on. So you're not going to see them on any flight tracker. Number three, if they're doing it from boats, which has also been proposed by both Mosh Alamaro and William Gray, that it could, they could inject carbon black dust from the ground it would be sucked into the inner eye wall so whether it's either boats or planes doing this type of chemical modification there is no way to track planes that you that basically the government doesn't want you tracking that leaves nothing but conspiracy theorists um postulating that next rad Doppler radars are somehow able to steer hurricanes with pinpoint precision. The truth of the matter is that since 1947 to present, there has never been any scientific proof or what they call scientific efficacy in cloud seeding. There is no such thing as weather control. There is only weather modification. You can modify a thing, you can try to make it rain more. In the United States, October through March of every year, there are ground-based cloud seeding generators 
called Aura Graphic Cloud Seeding that I operate um, all winter long, and they do snowpack augmentation on the Rocky Mountains. And they have since 1948 when Irving P. Crick invented the ground-based cloud seeding generator. Um, and nobody knows. Nobody knows that almost all of the water that's being you know, captured on these mountaintops, which feed all the tributaries and all of the water in the West is being paid for by companies like Idaho Power Company. Um, if you're paying your power bill in Idaho, by the way, they're modifying the weather and creating artificial snow on the Rocky Mountains. When you start to put all of these pieces together, whether it's the corporate side, whether it's the military side, um, you know, the government uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, everybody's tinkering with the weather and our foreign adversaries are too. So when you realize that China has um, pledged to put over 100,000 of these ground-based cloud seeding generators on the Himalayan plateaus, and they're in water wars with their neighbors like India over the Yangtze and the Brahmaputra River. And then you see these historic flood videos coming out of China. And then you realize that what they're doing is literally destabilizing weather on a worldwide basis. Their weather modification activities are on such a large scale that it could be considered geoengineering it could be considered a violation of the NMOD Treaty of 1978. And we're really on in on the precipice of a water war um, or weather wars. <laughs> so I guess the, the real takeaway from this is that um, as retired Colonel David Kuczynski said in 1994, um, the water will be to the next century what oil was to the last. Mm. And when you let that sink in, it really does put a new spin on things, especially with Iran claiming that the United Arab Emirates and Israel are stealing their weather. Mm. That's in the timeline as well. So as you get closer to the end of the timeline, you'll see things get crazier and crazier, like steering lightning bolts with laser beams. And the list goes on and well, on. Well, in fact, you mentioned laser beams here. Here's a picture. Have you mentioned this guy's name tonight? Micho, uh, Michio Kaku, I, uh, I've, <laughs> I have seen that video at least a thousand times at this point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And he's talking about lasers, is he not? Yes, he is. And that, that actually came about, I, I did a, a four-part series on uh, my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And then you can't make this stuff up. The Weather Channel did the exact same series called Hacking the Planet. And... They did it in the same order as the series I did on YouTube. And the next thing I knew, Michi Okaku's on freaking the lamestream media regurgitating stuff out. Like he didn't say the name. I'll say the name. There was a, there's a, what's called a femtosecond um, Terra Mobile trillion watt laser. Um, it fires in a femtosecond. So they have two different kinds, um, you know, these femtosecond lasers, which can ionize the clouds. Um, that causes water to coalesce on cloud condensation nuclei or cloud seeds. And then you have these other ones that are called dressed lasers. And in both cases, you, you need three things to make a cloud to make it rain. You need water vapor, you need something for it to stick to, and you need some spark of electricity, some ionization. That's normally in the form of galactic cosmic rays, um, but we can artificially induce that with lasers and with what are known as cloud ionizers. Now, all of these technologies are being used in the United Arab Emirates Rainfall Enhancement Program, and they're doing this with a bounty system. So that's why the UAE is currently the hub of all new weather modification technologies, because if you can make it rain on them, they will make it rain on you. Wow. Wow. Let me go <laughs> yeah, to a, you can't, let me you can't go make to, this stuff up. Let me go to a clip. Uh, it's in your it's in your on your website. 1980 NBC News. Well, well, I want you to respond to this. On clear days, you can often see long white lines being traced high in the sky. They are contrails of jet aircraft, actually long, slender clouds. Weathermen are finding them especially fascinating because a theory is being developed that those long white lines may be changing our weather for the better. Details from Roger O'Neill. 
The exhaust from jet engines, usually seen as long, thin trails of white clouds behind high-flying jet airplanes, may be a big reason why there are 30 fewer days of sunshine a year in the Midwest now than there were in 1900. The daily range between high and low temperatures has also narrowed. Weather researchers studying cloud cover in 10 Midwestern states found a sharp increase in cloudiness with the increase in commercial jet travel. Particularly in the main east-west jet corridor, there were even more clouds. A jet produces a contrail, or a cloud, because its exhaust consists primarily of water vapor. In the absence of natural clouds, given the correct atmospheric conditions, jet aircraft in high frequency can almost completely cover the atmosphere, visible atmosphere, with clouds. Simonin says unlike most changes in the atmosphere caused by man, this one is beneficial. Clouds help farmers in the Midwest by blocking the sun. Temperature extremes can damage plants and speed up the evaporation of soil moisture. In the winter, city people benefit because clouds act as a blanket, preventing warm air from escaping into the atmosphere. No one is trying to make clouds now using jet engines, but this study suggests that jet travel is inadvertently making our days more cloudy. And someday, weather researchers may be able to use jets on purpose to change our weather. Wow, but uh, this is all conspiracy theory. But here you go, 1980, oh. John Chancellor. There you go. Isn't that isn't that ironic? Maybe yeah. someday they might do it intentionally. <laughs> well, guess what? That someday is today. It's here, isn't it? And you you can go to contrails plural contrails dot org, and you can look at Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy Companies website where they talk about what's called contrail avoidance so in the video in 1980s they said this one is beneficial because it cools the planet but in reality after the grounding of all flights on 9 11 they uh, patrick menis from the langley research center he did a study on what they were talking about the, the diurnal temperature range narrows when it's cloudy meaning it's warmer at night when it's cloudy well guess what that's actually trapping heat at the ground level because of these artificial cirrus clouds. So when he said this the first time, they tried to debunk it, but then it happened again in 2008 with the Iceland, or 2009 with the Iceland volcano. And at this point, they, there became a big fuss about, oh, we might have to like carbon tax the airlines. Cause you know, the carbon cult is always after their right, next book. Right, man. that's right. Um, and it, as a result, this this idea of contrail avoidance or avoiding ice supersaturated regions where contrails will form, um, because that's where they will persist. And you can look at radio sound data, and and you know generally we we can predict it all the time. They banned chemtrails in Tennessee, and then we'll go troll the people in Tennessee by saying uh, the chemtrails are coming back to Tennessee tomorrow and everybody's freaking out like, how the hell did you know that? Well, the, uh, the honest answer is they've always known this. They've known this since the World War II. So Bill Gates' breakthrough energy, their chief scientist is Ken Caldera. And Ken Caldera is one of the top geoengineers in the world. And they are literally talking about now um, what Ulrich Schumann said in 2010, less warming, more cooling contrails, predictable for operational planning. Then I interviewed um, Dr. Rangasai Althori from the FAA's Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative. He said, we want more contrail-induced cirrus clouds during the day and none during the night. Interesting. So then I went on Dell Big Trees, the high wire, and I told him all about this. And the next day, a guy jumped in my Telegram chat. It's like, Hey, dude, you're going to like this. And it was the Royal Aeronautical Society in 2023 had a contrail avoidance group, Greener by Designs, CAG, contrail avoidance group. And in it, they said the quiet part out loud. We could avoid making heat trapping cirrus clouds at night and intentionally fly into ice supersaturated regions during the day to make cooling contrails, but that would be geoengineering. We should do it anyway. Wow. And if you go to contrails.org, um, you can actually see that Bill Gates has um, a map up, and in that map, 
Um, I went to their GitHub repo because I'm a coder. I've you know, been a code programmer and a hacker since I was like 12 years old. And if you scroll down the page, it's about halfway down, you'll see a map. And it'll actually show you in red or blue whether the contrails you're seeing, and that's the map right there, um, you'll see that they're showing, is that warming contrails or is it cooling contrails? Now, I went to the GitHub repo, and, and I was not the least bit shocked to find out that it was Ulrich Schumann's Contrail Cirrus prediction tool. The same guy that I had originally found, because I was looking for intent, and I found the word intent in the word more. It is accidental geoengineering until you say the word more, because that more implies intent. So if you want less warming, more cooling, more cooling being geoengineering, then you're intentionally trying to create clouds to cool the planet. That is the goal here. So while everybody's so focused on pumps and pipes and secret agendas, jet exhaust in the right conditions creates clouds and Bill Gates and company are literally now bragging about it because I've spent the last 15 years of my life like telling on them. Um, so they might as well admit to it now that they do want to make less warming, more cooling contrails during the day, none at night. And there's a secondary geoengineering proposal called contra um, contrail cirrus thinning um, or cirrus cloud thinning, CCT. And that's the idea of literally melting these clouds away at night if, if all else fails. So the, the three main types of geoengineering are stratospheric aerosol injection, uh, marine cloud brightening, and cirrus cloud thinning. Everybody talks about solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injection. Some people talk about marine cloud brightening, the idea of mimicking ship um, tracks by spraying sea salt into the sky to make clouds whiter, brighter, more reflective, reflect sunlight back to space. Nobody, and I mean nobody but this guy here, this little kid, <laughs> talks about serious cloud thinning. And I find that highly ironic. Um, so there's a lot to this, you know, to this whole, you know, story. Like there's always the diversions. Everybody focuses on um, you know, things like harp. And they go, Well, harp's controlling the weather. And I'm like, but harp's not on. And they're like, well, how do you know? And I'm like, you can tell when it's on. Well, how well, how can you tell when it's on? You can And for those who don't know, what is HARP? HARP is the high frequency active rural research program. And, and where in, where is it based? It's in Gakona, Alaska. It is an ionospheric heater. It's a 3.6 million watt transmitting system with 180 72 foot tall antennas with an effective radiated power of 5 billion watts. And it heats the ionosphere. So that is space weather modification. So we're talking 150 kilo kilometers to 300 kilometers up in the air. That's what it's affecting. So people would go, well, won't, can't that affect weather? Let's put this into context. For those who are out there saying that NEXRADS or HARP can steer the jet stream or a hurricane, a hurricane produces seven quadrillion joules per second of energy. To translate that into watts, you simply just say watts. It's the exact same thing. So seven quadrillion watts. That's seven with 15 zeros behind it. Now, I'm going to remind you, HARP at its best has about five billion watts worth of effective radiated power. A next red Doppler radar has 750,000 watts peak with an average of 1,300 watts. So riddle me this. How does something with less than a million watts of output affect something with 7 quadrillion watts of power per second? Mm. That's more than all the power we generate on the planet all year long from every power plant on the so, so you, know, on the so you don't planet. so so just to clear up because I I've never done a show on it because I don't know what to make of it. Harp is not causing earthquakes and creating all these floods. No, because Harp costs five hundred thousand dollars per hour to operate. 
So what, are they, what is the can, government using it for? To do something in space, you said? The government's no longer using it. Um, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy sold it to the University of Alaska Fairbanks because they moved on to, as John Hersher put it, other ways to control the ionosphere. So what was they, their ultimate goal with HARP? It, it was a test. It, it was basically to use the sky as an open air laboratory to try out all types of things. If you if you wanted to nail it down to three main things, <laughs> they they wanted to test out the idea of a radiation belt remediation system or to protect us from solar flares or high altitude electromagnetic pulse. Mm. The idea that Kim Jong-un could detonate a nuclear bomb high above America. Create an EMP. It, it would make an EMP and that would fry our electric systems. That would do more damage than if it just landed in a city. Some people would die in a city, but if you detonated it above America, you could take out the power grid. That's and right. According to the Heritage Foundation, two thirds of Americans would die within six months of starvation. So that's a big deal. So they sold it under the tether panel um, at the Eisenhower Institute as a way to mitigate radiation in the atmosphere, something called the Christophilos effect based on starfish prime hard tag teak, these upper atmospheric nuclear explosions back in the 1950s. Um, they discovered this effect then when it fried satellites. So they said, well, we could do the same thing by injecting shear Alvin waves and these different types of radio waves into the Van Allen belt. They also create artificial ionospheric mirrors to reflect radio waves over the horizon to deny enemy radio transmissions. So these are systems that are now deployed on a smaller scale, but they're mobile. And that also means that they're not a fixed target because if you were relying on HARP to do these types of geophysical warfare during World War III, you wouldn't want it in a single spot in Gakona, Alaska, because that'd be one of the first things they bomb. So instead, they moved on to putting them on barges, on boats, um, be, being on a trailer but that they could pull behind a Humvee. Um, even just recently, Ukraine attacked Starlink. Uh, Russia attacked Starlink over Ukraine doing the exact same technology. They have an ionospheric heater called Sura. Um, there's another ionospheric heater up in Norway called Tromso. So there was this one. This is coming at, down to satellite wars, right? Right. This is about this is space warfare. This is this is why there's a and this is why Trump force. probably created space force, right? This is and everybody UN mocked him. Everybody mocked him, but this is why Trump no. created space war force. Because between that and the laser blinding of uh, spy satellites by the Chinese shooting lasers at our spy satellites, between the fact that that and kamikaze satellites which are literally bombs sitting in satellites pretending to be communication satellites. Which is what Dr. Peter Vincent Pry said at this desk as the former CIA analyst and warned yep. about over and over. We produced his radio show. We produced his TV show. I don't know if you know that or not. But I have not, I've never heard anybody else say this, but I just, I know things. And well, I, that's I what he said. I and he said it's I don't reveal than, my sources. <laughs> it's better than 50% um, chance that North Korea is circling the globe with satellites coming over America right now, two of them, better than 50% chance one or both have nuclear weapons on board for EMP. Yeah, and the other idea being that we're so reliant, um, you know, on uh, what they call total total um, uh, informational dominance, like uh, it's the, the new warfare term. Um, why am I drawing a blank right now? That never happens to me. Um, C2... Um, something anyway doesn't matter the idea is that with with the more the more technology we have the more dependent our warfare systems are on communication systems and almost all of those communication systems are in space that is why space force is such a necessity at this point because there has been an increased you know move to weaponize space between and they also have things called hijacker satellites, where these are satellites that are mobile that could go to another satellite, reach out and grab it with an arm and just Crush throw it. it out. Yeah. Just throw it out. All it has to do is wiggle it, throw it towards the earth, and it's out of um, um, orbit. orbit. So all of these things are being tracked by Space Force with what, what they call the Space Fence, the SPARS system, um, along with things like the AN-TIPI-2s, these X-band radars. 
this is a very complicated world we live in. Well, right we're going to have to get more. We're going to have to do more on this. This is fascinating. Uh, will you come back? I certainly will. Let's do more. Let's make sure, though, folks, take a look at his website. We're, we're just scratching the surface on this website. He's got more than one. Uh, weathermodificationhistory.com. Weathermodificationhistory.com. Can you find the other uh, other websites by being on one of them? Will you find the others? Um, yeah, right there at the bottom, you if you see that. Um, there should be a, a, right beside that on the other side where it says connect.climateviewer.com. Mm-hmm. If you click on that, connect.climateviewer.com, it's on the bottom right. Right there. Yeah, just click on that. That's my own personal link tree. Um, it has all three of my websites, ways to support me. It's got my my sub stack, um, my Telegram chat, my BitChute Rumble Odyssey, um, you know, all the things. I do have a bunch of other social medias, but you can find me at Climate Viewer on X, at Climate Viewer on Rumble and um, YouTube. But, you know, my three websites are all on connect.climateviewer.com, and you can check out um, maps of all of the weather modification projects worldwide on Climate Viewer 3D, which is on climateviewer.org. Um, I actually had it ready to sh the screen share, but obviously that well, let's, might be. Let's, let's get you back though. Let's see if yeah, you're available. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that week. another time. Let's do that uh, next week. I'd love to, we'd love to talk to you about that because look, he he's got all these maps on there, and we're gonna let him, we're gonna have him come back, and we'll we'll get into all this. Fascinating. But in the meantime, there you go, folks. Go to his main website, which again is climate. Uh, or excuse me, weathermodificationhistory.com. Weathermodificationhistory.com. Go to the very far bottom. Click on connect.climateviewer.com. You'll find all of them. Excellent interview. Fascinating. Um, I feel like we got a major scoop tonight because no one else I know is talking to you right now that I know of in my circle. So uh, I think they will be, though, after they all see this cut up all over social media tomorrow. So great job, Jim. I appreciate it, Brandon. You too. Jim will be back. Jim Lee, folks. Weathermodificationhistory.com. Isn't that fascinating?